Welcome everyone to our Business Women Australia webinar. I am Leanne Jeffrey. I am the coordinator for Business Women Australia. And today we're really lucky to have Sasha Fulton with us as we talk about understanding women's health. So one thing is I am really excited about this because a hot minute ago I was a personal trainer and always loved working with the expertise of our physiologists. So thank you for joining us, Sasha. My pleasure. Excited to be here. Before we start, I just want to do a quick acknowledgement to country. People join our webinars from all around Australia. I am I come live from Perth or Bulu, and I I actually get to stand on the country of the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation. And I just want to pay my respects to all of our Indigenous elders, past, present, emerging, and just a big shout out to our Indigenous sisters in business. So. As I've said, I am the coordinator for Business Women Australia and thanks for joining us. BWA works to bring together a lot of women from Australia and all types of businesses and professionals and we have a great, great community. So we work together to actually highlight our leaders in, in our community and the fantastic Sasha is one of them. And everybody comes from such a diverse range of professions, whether they're business owners and entrepreneurs, directors, C-suites, consultants, and our emerging leaders, everyone's welcome to the show. And we're always working to better ourselves. Everyone who tends to join us has the same lot of shared values. And we'd love to hear from people because we, we love a good collaboration. We, we do include everyone, open and honest conversations all the time. And if you're like me, I am pathetically optimistic all the time. And we love to share that energy with everyone. And I do ask that everyone comes and joins us, connects with us. I will actually add mine and Sasha's LinkedIn's to connect with us and have a chat if you need to follow up with any questions after the webinar. And we, we don't get far if we don't have our members. We have a great, great membership. We've got two levels. We have our classics and our leaders, which is about to, uh, our classics and our premiums, which is about to change to our connectors and our leaders. Sasha is a leader within exercise physiology. And contact me if you need to know more. We have a we are starting to get our 2024 events registered now. But until then, we do have Melbourne's got an end of year long lunch with Jessica Schubert from Intact Teams. Perth, I think we have maybe five seats left for our end of year celebrations of stories, bubbles, and burlesque with Erin Clark, who is I had a podcast with her yesterday. She's a the queen of codeless technology. Well, that's what I call it. Sydney, we've got end of year celebration. So our very own national director, Lynn, is is going to be in Sydney. I think we've, we've only got a couple of seats left there as well. And the 8th of December, I've got Martina Saldi from Microsoft joining me about it, d diversity and inclusion in the workplace on a podcast. And we're kicking off in January with a masterclass with Lynn of effective goal setting. Now I'm going to hand you over to Sasha Fulton, who is a very, very amazingly accomplished woman. Sasha, you've worked with uh, the Olympic Committee, am I right? Uh, a couple of different Olympic committees, but yes, the uh, Australian Olympic Committee and the Paralympic Committee. Yeah, you've worked with Wace as a lead yes. um, physiologist. Um, oh, where do we go? Paralympics as well. We've got. Yeah, a few I've been lucky enough to attend a couple of um, a couple of Paralympics, um, Beijing in two thousand eight and London in twenty twelve. So, and you've also got a chapter in which I have read. Anybody who's out there? She's actually 
written a chapter in peak performance, a mindset tool for athletes. So you're a published writer as well. Yes, yet to do, yet to do my own, my own, my own book, but um, maybe, maybe that'll come one day. <laughs> but yeah, so thanks so much for joining us. I am going to just mute my mic and hand it over to you. Easy, not a problem at all. Thank you so much for the warm introduction, Leanne. Um, it's always lovely to have this amazing connection with BWA and um, thank you for the the ladies that are on the call today. I can't see or hear anyone, so I'm going to assume you guys are still there. Um, <laughs> and um, anyway, Le uh, Leanne, I'll have a I'll have a bit of a, a, ch a chat with you as we go as we go through as well. So look, um, I was. This is a, a topic that's really quite close to my heart. Um, understanding women's health. Um, as I talk to a lot of athletes and their parents and their coaches, I'm. I still just get the feeling that, um, yeah, not all of our young women and middle-aged women and older women are fully kind of aware of their own health. Um, I am still trying to learn myself, so I am not professing. I'm a doctor of sports science. I'm not a medical doctor. Um, so please don't, you know, don't ask me too many curly, curly medical questions. But I've got a lot of, um, yeah, amazing, I guess, support from some of the best um, sports medicine doctors and nutritionists and things that I follow and listen to and connect with. Um, and so... I often like to, yeah, bring a lot of the, the work that everyone's doing together. Um, there's a lot of work being done at the moment in um, certainly in the athletic space for women's health. And, you know, it's taken us a long, long, long time, but we finally realised that our young female athletes are not young male athletes and we need to treat them so. So they need to be, oh, hello, Kath. I can see your beautiful face now. Hi. <laughs> um yeah, it's, um, you know, so whether this webinar directly, um, you know, has some um, insights for yourself as a woman, um, whether it's that you have other women in your life, older women, maybe parents or colleagues or friends, maybe you've got younger women in terms of siblings or daughters um, or nieces, um, and you can pass some of this um, you know, uh, content on. I, I just love the idea of being able to create conversation. So I guess that's probably the biggest um, thing that I'm hoping that people take away from this webinar. It's not necessarily, so as I said before, don't think that I'm, I'm not a guru on women's health and not a sports medicine doctor, um, but I love the idea of let's create conversation and make sure that we're talking about these, you know, really important topics. So very, very briefly, um, I was an Ironman triathlete myself. I'm now an open water swimmer um, when I am not uh, managing a three-year-old and running a business. Um, from a professional standpoint, I'm an accredited sports scientist. And as Leanne mentioned, I moved to WA to complete um, a position with the Western Australian Institute of Sports. So I was there for 10 years. Uh, and then set up my own business as an athlete preparation specialist um, and the founder of Peak Preparation. So I guess my three uh, sort of core business areas are um, uh, uh, well-being, as particularly for athletes, leadership, and um, of course, sports science education. I'm a lover of travel, so it's pretty exciting that um, the world is kind of back open again. Um, and I am a mother to a three, soon to be four-year-old daughter. So I guess one question that I kind of wanted to kick off with, and um, we've got a nice small group here. So if anyone is bold enough or wants to join in, um, this is my question to you. How confident are you that you understand and are on top of your own health? Anyone want to jump in? I love this question. So. One of my, at being a former personal trainer, one of my specialties was actually training in women's health and, you know, working with postnatal women. So I, I'll be confident enough to know that uh, I knew being a mum working and training, I actually was one of those people who overdid it and I went to burnout. Mm-hmm. So having that fitness background and understanding, I also know that, you know, 
women tend to put a lot too much pressure on themselves to get into that fit state. So one of the things that's really important is people understanding that terrible word because I think we use it we use it too much, but that balance of understanding fitness because people think you've got to go to the gym seven days a week. Absolutely. Not understanding recovery and food, we kind of demonise it a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think for me a lot of that is that that getting that understanding across is going from what is an acceptable balance, what is too much and what is too little. Absolutely. And I think, you know, it's a great use of the word, um, you know, the, the core word in there of being health, which as a woman, I think we tend to immediately go to, um, you know, eating less and, <clears throat> and going to the gym more. Um, whereas health, you know, as we do know, and we'll get into it as we go, means so much more um, than just whatever size skirt or dress we're wearing or whatever we're deciding to eat on that day. Um, you know, there's so much more, more to a female's health. Um, Kath, did you have a, a comment in there? Yeah, I just wanted to say that I um, accidentally learned to be confident with my health after I was uh, I received gynecological cancer treatment. Uh, it was pretty chaotic and I just thought why are we so in the dark with gynecological health so that's uh, you know I seem to know I've got 10 awards for what I do aren't I great aren't I wonderful but I'm still yet challenged to to get into women's minds how important gynecology is and especially I mean I'll share here I've had my clitoris vulva and lymph glands removed due to cancer and I can be pretty much ostracized by even by lots of women that, mm. you know, good girls don't talk about the vulva and they call it a vagina instead. So, I, you know, I'm pretty much empowered, but I just wish I could start, find some more avenues to, to share my wealth and knowledge. So uh, I'm interested to hear what you have to say, Sasha. Oh, Kath, thank you so much. <laughs> you bring you a tear to my eye. That's um. Yeah, a really amazing share and I am 100% keen to talk with you afterwards and at a later date and um, see what we can do. Funnily enough, I've just, um, you know, I've just picked up a, a, a book, um, I, I think it's called Only For Me um, and it's a, it's a book designed for um, sort of toddlers basically about learning their own bodies. And again, thank goodness that the author of this beautiful book, which I'll share with you at some point, um, you know, says we must use the words vag vagina and vulva. Yeah, exactly. it, it's so incredibly important that, yeah. and, and, you know, as a mum for, for a young girl, I mean, I'm already having, you know, conversations with her about stranger danger. And, and part of that is helping her to know her body um, and, and be wholly aware that this is not called, this is not the secret place. You know, this is this is not the place that we don't talk about. This is the place that we do talk about. This but is I had, I, sorry to interrupt, but I had a, a physiotherapist say in a forum recently that she will tell her daughter it's a vulva when she's old enough. So there's still people say, oh, that's not the same mindset out there. But there is this mindset that, you know, the stigma. So, you know, we do need to talk about it. And my book was called If If Only I Knew. And if only oh. I knew more, you know, I could have helped save some women's lives. So Yeah, sure. Yeah, so sure. much to be done. Absolutely. I, I, was saying, I love so that. For being on. And, you know, and this is the thing is when we talk about, you know, age-appropriate labelling, I, I did get kicked back. My daughter's now nine and I was always very open and honest because a vulva is a vulva. It's just like I call this a hand, not little strings at the end of my arm. Yeah. It's an anatomy, it's an anatomical, you know, vocalisation. This is what it is. It's not anything else. It's nothing to be ashamed of. Half the population have it. Mm. Absolutely. You know, it but I I need, sorry, you'll have to 
keep me quiet if I go on too much, all right, because I understand that. But I, I thought, why are we like that? Why do we call it something else? And I discovered the word pudendum, and the Latin version of that word says female genitalia, one who should and ought to be ashamed, the shameful part of a woman. So for hundreds and hundreds of years, we've had to call it a vagina. But now I'm really excited because after 30 years of lobbying, you know, the vulva is coming out. So it's very really exciting for me. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah, thank you so much for being on and thank you for sharing your story, Cal. Okay. Um, so if we go through here, I can't, oh, here we go. Um, so the key principles that we um, were going to uh, cover today, a um, bit of an introduction on uh, just women's health and um, the age cycle as well for females. Um, some menstrual cycle considerations, which I still think are really important um, to consider regardless of um, a female's age. So even when we're in our adult years and we've had a menstrual cycle for years and years and years and years and years and, years and we think that we know it all, there are still changes that can happen. And, you know, we need to be really on top of understanding and asking ourselves questions of, when things do change, why they change. Um, and, you know, being able to um, go and seek help when we when we need it um, and at least start a conversation going with a trusted medical practitioner. Um, dietary considerations, uh, the foundations of good bone health, and then I've just literally had to call the last one so much more. Um, so, Kath, I haven't been able to go into a huge amount of detail about cervical health, breast health, iron studies, uh, menopause, um, prepartum, postpartum, there's so, so, so much to cover. And I'll probably create a 10 module female, um, you know, um, system, or, you know, at some point. So Kath, I'll, um, we can do that one together later on. Um, but at least let's, um, yeah, let's get the, the conversation, the conversation going. So, um, you know, what I find really fascinating is just to start with looking at um, an individual's life life stages. So the different and the different features that are characterized at each stage. So for a woman um, accompanied by considerable hormonal changes, we tend to divide our life stages into infancy, childhood, adolescence, which is our sort of puberty reproductive age, adulthood, which might be our pre and postnatal um, uh, phase, uh, menopause and then postmenopause, um, and that's in addition to pregnancy and delivery that are kind of generally included as obviously events that are unique to a woman, uh, which is why we're we're having you know this conversation. And what I've um, found is that from the research that I've done, and this particularly applies to bone health, which is another passion of my um, with my mum and the health um, complications that she's currently going through is just how important one stage of life then influences the next stage of life. So, and we'll talk about that more when we talk about bone health, but particularly in that bone health, um, and not that any of us, well, I don't know how old everyone is on the call, and I'm certainly not going to ask that question, but we should be able to, by the way, shouldn't we? We should be able to have that conversation. Um, but, you know, understanding that when we're in our teenage years, that's where all the foundations of our bone health are actually being laid. Um, and, you know, so when we talk about, you know, it's important for our young girls and women in the community to exercise and get good calcium, this is not just to help them, you know, fit into size eight swimming costumes or anything for the summer beach. This is to help them when they're 88 at the other end of their life so that they're not, you know, suffering unnecessary falls and uh, breaks and, and things like that as well. So, yeah, I think just really understanding how much. Um, health in one stage of life then influences health in the next stage of life. And then I wanted to um, throw out to the floor and just put down some questions here that we should be able to ask women. And again, I mean, let alone talk about a vagina and a vulva, I feel that sometimes even talking about a menstrual cycle or being sexually active um, is can be almost feel like embarrassing or taboo subjects. 
So, you know, let alone actually starting to talk about certain parts of our body, there are sometimes even phases that I feel, um, you know, young girls and young women are not always comfortable to uh, talk about. So, and and don't uh, get me wrong, you know, of course, uh, I think we need to have, you know, they need to be trusted um, um, collaboration and trusted relationships. Um, it's not as though you're sort of going to walk into the chemist one day and ask your chemist when her first period was, you know, but it's a conversation that you should be able to have once you've built a trusted relationship with a friend or a client or, or you know, someone that you're communicating with. Um, so when was the first day of your period? Um, are you currently taking any medications? Do you have any allergies that you're aware of? Um, <clears throat> have you had any surgeries? Are you sexually active? Have you been pregnant? Do you wish to have children in the future? Do you feel safe at home? That's a whole nother topic, which we won't talk about today, but um, maybe we can talk about it at some point. So menstrual cycle considerations. Um, such a simple little graph here, um, but again, one that I often find um, women and particularly the young girls at school age, sorry, two seconds, I'm just going to put a fan on here. There we go. Um, are not always um, wholly familiar of a what a menstrual cycle actually means. Um, so a menstrual cycle is, of course, our entire 28 day cycle um, and the period or the bleeding phase is just five or six days of that. Um, we've got two main phases um, as part of the menstrual cycle. So we have the follicular phase and we have the luteal phase. So ovulation tends to happen roughly in the middle of the two phases. Um, and of course, mainly are um, that's mainly in ovulation. And in the luteal phase is when we're having um, this um, particular high amount of estrogen being produced. This is another um, just quite a good diagram that, again, um, shows the follicular phase and the luteal phase. Um, so showing um, the days of the cycle where a uterus lining is actually breaking down and menstruation is occurring. Um, the uterus lining then thickening again, uh, ovulation occurring, and then the uterus lining um, continuing to thicken before um, it breaks down again, and that becomes our cycle. Um, and as a former um, Ironman triathlete, I mean, I just remember so clearly what sort of a badge of honour it was um, to say that I had, you know, my period had stopped and I had gone for months and months and months, probably even a few years, without having um, a, a menstrual cycle at all. Um, and I think, you know, we're, just, we're getting a lot better with our young athletes about having these conversations early and helping them to understand that the period and a menstrual cycle uh, is so incredibly normal and so incredibly important. Um, and recently, a, a podcast that I was just on myself um, labelled, you know, a menstrual cycle for a young female as a monthly health card. So it's a monthly health report card for the body um, that we get to tell us that the body is in good working order. So when we talk about um, periods, there are some things to consider as to what is actually normal and what is abnormal. Um, and again, uh, there are lots of different causes uh, for abnormal periods, but I think it's really important that not just for our young women, um, but for, uh, you know, whatever stage of life we're at, that we understand um, what is considered normal and more importantly, what is considered not normal. So the causes of um, abnormal periods can be many different things. Um, changes in sleep patterns, uh, illnesses, new medications, stress, and it's certainly not just um, too much exercise that can cause changes in um, periods or menstrual cycles, but it's also not enough exercise or a, a big decrease in exercise from a previously active person. So some things just to be aware of, um, missing your period for more than one month, um, should be a warning sign, uh, having irregular cycles, uh, periods that last for long 
periods of time, uh, pardon the pun, um, or very heavy periods. There's lots of, um, I could go into a lot more detail here, um, but there are lots of details around, um, you know, we've worked out what is sort of a normal amount of bleeding that should we should consider normal to occur on a monthly basis and then what is abnormal as well. Um, so also um, countering on that are the symptoms that, um, you know, occur when um, females are on their menstrual cycle. So um, any symptom that affects your ability to perform um, normally in life should be considered abnormal, if that makes sense. So if you have so much pain that you are not able to get out of bed, that is not normal. Um, if you are feeling so incredibly lethargic and exhausted, that you can't get out of bed and go to work or go to school, that is not normal. So anything that, yes, there can be pain, yes, there is bleeding, yes, there can be hormones flying everywhere and we might get a little bit more emotional than we usually do, um, some things like that. But if it's actually affecting your ability to train, work and function, um, it's a conversation that needs, needs to be had. I'll just um, sort of skip through these, but there are a few medical uh, terms as well for um, uh, some of these conditions. So if you have not had a period for at least three menstrual cycles, um, this is termed amenorrhea. So primar primarily amenorrhea um, might start in young teenage girls who haven't actually started menstruating uh, by 15 or 16 years of age. Um, it's also considered primary if it's the absence of a menstrual cycle for greater than 90 days. There is also a term called secondary amenorrhea, um, and this is um, no period for months in a woman who has previously had regular cycles or no periods for six months in a woman that has previously had irregular periods. Okay, so there's this term of primary primary amenorrhea and secondary amenorrhea. Um, there is also a, call, a, a term called oligomenorrhea, which is um, having periods that are more than 35 days apart. So this would also be considered menstrual dysfunction. Um, it tends to be a lot more common in athletes that are um, sort of exercising on very, uh, you know, multiple times a day um, and tend to be on caloric restriction as well. Um, so athletes with amenorrhea um, are also the ones that can be at risk of REDS, which is relative energy deficiency, which we will talk about um, a little bit later on. Certainly not just reserved for athletes, um, I think women, um, Leanne already mentioned the word burnout, um, which we all know so many women can be predisposed to burnout because we feel that we are superhuman beings and we need to um, live our lives at 100% and 99% is not quite good enough. Um, so red S is really when um, the body um, is starting to actually turn off its non-essential functions. Uh, so obviously um, when, you know, breathing, having a heart rate, um, blinking, um, having blood flowing through your body, they are all essential functions, which the body will go over and above to ensure that happen. They're so clever that they even happen when we're sleeping. So they're the ones that are outside of our control. We don't control to some extent, we don't control many of those. They just happen naturally. But when it comes to non-essential functions, such as having a menstrual cycle, um, that can be in certain situations where the body deems that actually this is a, a function that's not essential to life and death right now. And we might just turn this off for now so that we can preserve energy, so that we can preserve calories as well. Um, but there are obviously, as we know, there are other things that come from that. Um, polycystic ovaries um, is something else that women need to be mindful of. Um, and um, having irregular cycles can be one of the um, uh, 
sort of um, uh, things that we can predict from that. So, um, and there are lots of other thyroid issues and pregnancy as well that can um, confuse things at times as well. Dysmenorrhea um, is too much pain. Um, and I don't know if you guys have seen this um, menstrual island infographic, but it's um, it's sort of quite a quite a fun one um, with bloaty town and the sea of blood and the cloth aisles and misery toll and sleepy cove and um, it's that um, it's that island that um, all of the men in our lives will um, never quite understand. So um, pre-menstrual syndrome, so PMS um, is this um, uh, syndrome that tends to occur actually one or two weeks before uh, bleeding occurs. Um, and it can be coupled with other symptoms such as irritability, bloating, constipation, pimples, fatigue. Um, and again, I guess it's important to note that um, it looks different for everyone. Um, I've actually found that my premenstrual um, syndrome um, um, sort of functions have changed since I am since after having a child. So I tend to get a lot more pain now with the period than I used to, but I can still function and I can still do my normal daily activities. Um, so the painful um, period phase 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 again. Um, when a period is painful, but it can be, um, the pain can be maintained with basic medication. And I consider basic medication um, such as a Panadol or a period specific um, pain medication, then I don't, then it's not um, a pain that is interfering too much with training and normal activities. Um, but again, if it's a pain that's preventing you from getting out of bed in the morning, then that's a pain that should be um, should be looked into. Um, and menorrhagia, I have not pronounced that pro um, properly at all. So excuse me there. Um, and that this one is too much bleeding or super, super heavy bleeding that lasts for more than a week. Um, so excessive menstrual flow that might be lasting for greater than seven days. Um, if a female is needing to change a super pad or a tampon more frequently than every two hours um, or they're leaking through pads and tampons, that should be an indication, an indication that flow is too heavy. And again, um, that is a conversation that needs to happen with a um, sports medicine doctor. Um, there's obviously there's a strong correlation with iron deficiency um, and secondary blood loss. So obviously a period we're considering secondary blood loss. It's not blood loss that has come from a wound, um, but it is still blood loss. And so we need to consider uh, iron deficiency um, in women as well. Um, and I think as well, um, it's taken a while, but consideration of different uniforms. So um, there, there's been lots of talk in the past about the sporting attire that young women and girls have had to wear, um, you know, considering white garments, um, skin tight garments, very short skirts, all the rest of it. Um, and again, finally, lots of conversation um, is being generated and women are actually able to pipe up and have a bit more of a say as to what they want to train and compete in. <clears throat> Um, hormonal contraception, excuse me, um, again, is really one that I think needs to be had with a sports medicine um, doctor slash expert. There are lots of different types of medication out there. And I think it's just important that young women are aware of why they are seeking um, to to go to use contraception. So asking those questions around, is it to do with pain? Um, is it because a female is now sexually active? Is it because um, periods are just getting too heavy and they want a way of controlling that? Um, is it a way of manipulating the period around training or competition or uh, life events that are important to a female? But making sure those questions are really had in detail because um, being open and honest with having those conversations um, and the why might actually influence why 
a sports medicine doctor um, suggests one type of contraception over another type of contraception. Um, and I've certainly worked with lots of young females where, um, pardon me, starting a contraception has really thrown their menstrual cycles out of balance. Um, so some have then not had a menstrual cycle for long periods of time. Others have had excessive, excessive bleeding for day for up to 10 days at a time. Um, so just, yeah, making sure that it's not as simple as just, you know, saying I, I want to be on hormonal contraception, I want the pill, starting to take the pill. Um, you know, I think women need to take more ownership and more accountability as well. So asking the questions, what is it for? And making sure you're having those regular conversations if any symptoms start changing once you start being on the contraception itself. I think menstrual tracking, um, not certainly not just for athletes, but for all um, all women, is a really um, important thing to do. There are um, lots of apps out there that make it pretty easy to track your menstrual cycle. Um, but if you're like me and you just like to use a pen and paper and a normal paper diary, then that just works fine as well. But basically, it gives um, us an understanding of what is normal for you. So that we know that, you know, everyone's um, monthly menstrual cycle might look slightly different in terms of the number of days of bleeding or the amount of blood or the, the different symptoms that occur. But what we need to work out is what is normal for you so that when something starts becoming not normal, it's a conversation that, you know, can be had and you're, you know, you've got some um, parameters there to look at and know what has been normal in the past. Um, and as I think I, I mentioned before, a monthly menstrual cycle should actually be a good parameter. It's a parameter of good health, if you like. It means that the body is happy, it's healthy, it's not too stressed, it's not having caloric deficiency, it's not too heavy, it's not too light, um, and it's generally pretty happy. So that's um, always a good thing to know. Certainly there's a link to training and performance. Um, and that's where, um, you know, for any um, athletes or women out there with young athletic daughters, um, longitudinal data is always what's going to help a sports medicine professional um, to understand whether there actually has been a change in symptoms or not. So collecting that longitudinal data, knowing that it's individualised, and I think certainly um, feeling for a woman to feel like they know when to expect a period, um, again, we've all been there where it's caught us by surprise, um, but there, you know, we don't sort of need to live in that um, not knowing stages anymore. We've got lots of information available to us, um, and then it does give us, um, you know, the ability to manipulate cycles if we need to. Um, but I think, you know, regardless, again, regardless of whether we're talking about um, an athlete here or, or not, a healthy female equals better performance. Uh, and if better performance is performing in your job, performing as a mother, performing as a wife, performing as a as a sports person, whatever it is that you're performing in um, is, you know, that's that's important to you and your life. So as I mentioned, there are lots of different um, apps out there and they will encourage you what to track of well as well. Sorry. So it tends to be the cycle length, the days of bleeding and the symptoms. Um, very easy to do it um, on Apple Watches um, or any of our smartphones these days have apps that can track periods for you. Um, always concerned of time here. So um, let's jump into, and um, I meant to say, if anyone has any um, questions, I've got some, I'm seeing some of the comments in the chat box here. Excellent. So we can come back to those. Um, at the end of the webinar when we have time. But if anyone does have any questions, please feel free to raise a hand, take yourself off mute um, or put any comments in the chat box. So nutrition um, and females, not specifically females, but we're talking about females today. So, um, you know, it's so, you know, nutrition, I think we've we've tried to simplify it. And I think sometimes, sometimes we don't need to overcomplicate it but sometimes we also don't need to completely simplify it. 
Um, and being healthy and eating well is not always as simple as just eat this and don't eat this. Um, and I think just even by sort of, um, you know, saying those type of words, it makes um, it, it makes it a little bit black and white. Um, and the nutrition space is, you know, anything but, but black and white. You know, it is a complex space um, and it, um, it relies upon a lot of knowledge and it re relies upon an environment. It relies upon a person's culture, um, certainly their relationship with food their body image, their social support, their capability, curiosity, I think is a great word here, um, and security as well. Um, and I was, yeah, always, I get quite upset to look at these statistics, but we've got 45% of our female athletes here in Australia um, that are considered to have an eating disorder or disordered eating. Um, and I like that we've finally been able to flip um, an eating disorder on its head and call it disordered eating as well. Um, it is a complex space um, and it doesn't always need to be, but any time that a female is, um, or a male for that matter as well, is, um, you know, um, labelling food too much, counting too many calories, only eating certain foods, banning themselves of other foods, um, certainly, you know, this whole, um, you, you know, weight loss regimes of cutting carbohydrates, to me, I classify that as disordered eating, to take an entire food group out of your um, normal diet, because someone has told you that you might lose weight from it, um, is, you know, disordered eating. And I think we have to realise that all of these types of things, they don't just impact the individual as well, um, they impact everyone around that individual um, and they take a huge toll on mental health and performance. So I always like to talk to um, the young athletes that I am um, working with about labelling food as good or bad uh, and we tend to do it quite regularly. Um, you know, we're good if we eat a salad and we're bad if we eat a piece of chocolate cake. Um, but, of course, I think it's... Um, it's very, once we start labelling food as good or bad, it's very easy to start making it a um, sort of like a moral choice as well. So then I'm good for eating a, a salad translates to I'm a good person because I've eaten a salad. Um, or it translates to I'm not just a bit wicked um, because I've had a piece of chocolate or a piece of chocolate cake, I'm a bad person. Um, and there's a big difference there between, you know, labelling yourself as a bad person um, and labelling yourself as having a treat um, or having a sometimes food. So um, I always in, um, encourage the young women um, and males that I work with to try and at least get curious with their eating habits as opposed to critical with them as well. Um, so we won't go into a huge amount of detail on here, but I think at least, um, you know, gaining away awareness. And I think this really like nutrition and health, of course, do go hand in hand. So as opposed to, um, you know, labeling foods as good or bad, let's get curious about the foods that we eat. Uh, let's gain awareness as to why is it that I feel like eating chocolate all day today? Um, or why is it? And often when I unpack that with athletes, it's because they haven't eaten breakfast in the morning um, or they certainly haven't eaten enough food during the day. So I know sometimes we can all think we're, you know, well and good because we've skipped a meal. But if that means that we're then getting starving, hungry and eating um, too much of food that might not, not be so nutritious for us, um, then it means that... Um, I mean, put it this way, I, for m myself, no one can ever believe the amount of food that I consume. I consume stupid amounts of food. Um, and it actually means that when it comes to the evening, I have chocolate every single day, um, pretty well after dinner every single night, but I can only stomach one or two pieces of chocolate. Um, that is the amount, the, the most that I can eat because I've actually eaten so much during the day. Um, so one or two pieces is fine for me, where I've got plenty of friends that can sit down and demolish an entire block of chocolate. Um, and I still want to say a lot of that is because they haven't, they simply aren't eating enough during the day. Um, 
So I think that's something to consider as well. But also, you know, being empowered enough that we can make decisions based on what feels good for our body in a certain time. So there's nothing wrong with um, sitting down and having a piece of chocolate cake if that is what you deem you need. Leanne. Actually, I was going to say, can I jump in on that? Because a lot of people also don't realise when we're talking about, especially when we're talking about the phases of our period as well, everyone, you know, when you have a look at that day or sometimes it can be up to that week before you have your period, you'll have a day where you've just gone, why did I suddenly eat so much? Yep, and totally. Understanding your cycle and understanding the food consumption before it is actually really important because, once again, like I've talked about earlier on how we can demonise food, is a lot of people don't realise going, oh, you know, I just ate so much and they don't kind of click that when we're getting prepared to have our period, you know, we we need those little bit of extra calories as well, so our body, because, you know, our iron levels drop. Absolutely. Everything starts to drop as we prepare to menstruate. So by understanding your period, a lot of people don't realise, you know, that food consumption where you suddenly feel guilty about eating so much, sometimes your body's actually just saying, you know what, I'm, I'm getting prepared to menstruate, you're going to eat, and being allowing ourselves to go, okay, yeah, I'm getting my period. As long as we're not dragging it out to eating that much every day, but understanding when your cycle is and when that excess consumption comes in, you kind of give yourself that leeway and that grace to go, okay, well, you know, this is my body. This is what I'm doing. Absolutely. And I think, um, I mean, even going like a bit further than that, I've started looking at like seasonal nutrition as well. Um, you know, so we're just coming into salad, into um, salads. We're just coming into summer now, but it's no wonder that, you know, we're stunned, you know, on a 40 degree day, we are not craving a beef stroganoff. Um, with, you know, we're not tending to crave a hot, heavy meal. We want something that's lighter and cooler and more refreshing. So, you know, it's, you know, throughout the winter when we really kind of craving those stews or those curries or the soups or the chunks of bread with butter. I mean, it's cold and miserable and wet outside. Nobody wants to eat a salad when it's cold and miserable and wet outside. So I think, you know, we don't have to, I, I, totally, we don't have to demonise ourselves for feeling that way. Um, and, you know, I mean, fruit and vegetables, I could literally talk all day about. Um, and I've actually got a proposal in with Woolworths at the moment um, because I'm so conscious myself that, you know, we don't usually in the past, we had to eat seasonally. Um, so we weren't we weren't able to eat strawberries all year round because strawberries don't grow in certain conditions. But of course, we've worked out how to grow everything under the sun all year round. Um, yet, God forbid, if there's, you know, bananas are suddenly not on the shelves and we can't get access to them. But what it means is that we've all got really comfortable with eating sort of two or three different vegetables and two or three different fruits. And we don't actually tend to diversify as much as we once had to. Um, you know, and just, yeah, totally being able to understand all of those different things and being able to link these things together, um, yeah, is really important. So when we're talking about um, nutrition, I also, as opposed to literally going into, um, which we can do another day, but like on the five food groups and talking about the different minerals and vitamins, what is the real why of nutrition? And the real why of nutrition well, certainly for an athlete, it's to improve um, improve speed and strength. But for all of us, it's to support growth and progress. Um, and progress can look anything you want it to look, but that might be just achieving in life. Um, we need nutrition. Um, you know, having watching that um, that battery, you know, life on our phone um, ties in so closely, I think, to, you know, as that battery is going down, that is like your daily energy levels. Um, and so, you know, skipping meals or trying to seriously cut calories in the hope of dropping weight can have a lot of different other impacts. Um, it might make people more susceptible to injury and illness. Um, and then that means that you're less able to exercise. So, you know, I think just coming back to why do we eat? What is the function of eating? Um, because it certainly isn't just a tool for body composition change, right? Which is 
kind of what sometimes we've gone to. Um, when we're looking at, I just wanted to highlight a couple of important nutrients, which I think are particularly important for females. So looking at um, total energy. So looking at, um, so obviously total energy is the amount of energy that you expend per day versus um, the amount of energy that you're consuming per day. And I think, you know, sometimes females think that, oh, if I have an exercise today, then I need to cut my calories but they're forgetting that they have three, four-year-olds running around the house and, you know, um, you know, running after toddlers and doing driving drop-offs and pickups and preparing dinner and being on your feet and doing 10 loads of washing and carrying the house and the weight of the world on your shoulders. That takes energy. So it, it mustn't be that space of I'm allowed to have a piece of chocolate or I'm allowed to have a meal because I exercised this morning. Um, you are allowed to have a meal because you're a human being and you need to eat three times a day minimum, um, you know, but again, making sure that we've got that right mindset there as well. Um, and then also looking at vitamin D, iron and calcium um, in particular. So vitamin D, um, we know is absolutely critical to bone health. Now, vitamin D mainly comes from sun exposure, but you would be amazed as to how many athletes in Australia suffer from low vitamin D levels. Can you guess which athletes they are? Anyone want, want to guess? Which group of athletes suffers from low vitamin D levels? Gymnasts. Yes, gymnasts. Well done, 10 points. And for that matter, um, you know, gym goers, if you're doing all of your activity in a gym, now you would think in Australia it is impossible to suffer from low vitamin D. Um, but literally our little gymnasts, they're training so many hours per week that they don't always have the energy to go out to the park like other kids do or go on play dates at the beach or do that type of thing. So, um, yeah, it's, um, you know, it's really important that as females, we are monitoring our vitamin D levels. Iron is another super important one. Um, and I actually encourage all of the women that I have do any work with to get their iron studies checked on an annual basis. Um, I'm always, um, yeah, I'm always concerned when I talk to women that have either never had their iron levels checked um, or, you know, got them checked 10 years ago, but they were fine then, so they haven't bothered to kind of go back. Um, for me, it's an annual, if not biannual event that I just make sure kind of happens. Um, so certainly, you know, certainly now the cost of red meat is sky high at the moment and people are sometimes cutting back just because it is so expensive at the moment. But then we're also getting all of this um, detrimental health being fed our way that, um, you know, red meat not might not be so good for us, but, you know, small amounts regularly um, still will ensure that you're getting the amount of iron that you need. Um, and again, certainly calcium. So for me, those rich sources of calcium should be being consumed at every um, uh, meal. So breakfast, lunch and dinner. Um, but again, sometimes if I sort of, um, you know, talk to my friends, they're like, oh, well, I don't eat breakfast. So I don't, you know, I don't get any calcium in there. I have a peanut butter sandwich at lunchtime and an apple. So there's also no calcium in there. Um, and then I have, I, I don't know, a piece of steak and veggies for dinner. Um, so there is no calcium in there. So, you know, really being mindful as to how many servings of calcium, you know, we are getting in per day. Um, iron, um, as I said, such a, an important one and really it's so essential for so many different um, functions of the body. So all of our um, oxygen transportation um, is really relied upon with iron. Um, it also plays a key role in our immune function. Um, and obviously as women and having blood loss during menstruation, we actually require far greater iron than men actually do during our reproductive years. Um, so there are lots of different um, tables and information that you can get out there as to how much iron we should be consuming today per day. 
Um, but I think first and foremost, it's important to go and, you know, arm yourself of what are the different sources of iron that I can consume. Because it's certainly not just found in red meat, um, lots of different sources um, of iron too. Uh, relative energy deficiency uh, or red S. Um, again, we tend to talk about this in terms of um, athletes, but it's certainly not just reserved for the athletic population. Um, so it's a cascade of symptoms that can happen when there is not enough available energy to cover the cost of our body systems. And then on top of that, any training or activity that we're doing as well. So um, again, I think it's really important that um, women are looking at the various signs. So, um, you know, changes in our performance um, or our training, massive changes in our mood, such as increased irritability that doesn't just happen in, in conjunction with our periods. Um, ongoing fatigue, I had a, I was at my daughter's school last night um, having a brilliant, um, there was a brilliant presentation from this organisation called Real Schools. And um, we went around the room and the lady had asked us, what are, what are, what are two um, feelings that you're feeling right now? And I think there were 14 women in the room and 13 women said tired, tired and, you know, curious or tired and brave or tired and this, um, you, you know, and it's like, hold on a minute, is this acceptable that we've got, you know, just, and if we translate that out to the majority of the population, is it acceptable that most of us are walking around feeling tired and exhausted most of the time? Um, but even to challenge that one step further, I guess, is is tired the right, the right word to use? Or are we, is it overwhelmed with emotion? Um, is it sleepy? Um, you, you know, what does tired, is it tired because we actually haven't eaten? So is it actually hunger um, that we're talking about? But to, you know, get back in check um, with emotions, which is probably a whole another topic. Certainly reoccurring injuries um, or illness or loss of a cycle um, are all signs to monitor when it comes to um, relative or low energy availability or relative energy deficiency. So again, um, you know, beyond just looking at numbers, I think being able to, you know, so as opposed to just being able to, you know, measure all of the food that we're in taking, um, asking the questions. So talking to uh, the young women in our lives about their energy levels, about their recovery, about their mood, about their sleep. Um, you know, it's not necessarily just about the what, but how do you feel today? Um, and really understanding that why of nutrition as opposed to what we should or shouldn't be um, consuming. So I think um, certainly when we're talking about weight, um, which for some reason as, um, you know, we've made it a hot topic for females um, to talk about weight, um, but, you know, there's so much more um, than just talking about body weight and what, dress size a woman should or shouldn't be, um, you know, using. So being able to reframe that conversation um, and talk more about energy levels, talking about fatigue levels, talking about performance levels is so much more um, informative than talking about weight. Um, being able to remove the comparison. So I've got some young runners um, at the moment that we're working through. They get thrown off. If there's a girl standing next to them that has longer legs than they do, then they deem that they've lost the race already. Um, so, you know, being able to, you know, remove comparison because we're all very different. We, we, we're different height-wise, we're different width-wise, we've got different length legs, we've got different shapes and sizes, and that makes us wonderful and that makes us unique and that needs to be celebrated, um, you know, not having legs up to our armpits. Um, certainly avoiding shame, you know, I think any time that a, a female in your so circle is um, expressing that feeling of shame, um, you know, it's such an incredibly powerful emotion um, and, you know, it, um, it really needs to be kind of taken into consideration as to what that person might be going through. Um, and certainly if there is 
rapid weight change, whether that's up or down, um, being able to ask the why. So ask that question and get a better feel for why that might have happened. Uh, foundations of good he bone health. So again, um, you know, if we look at when peak bone um, growth occurs and when peak bone mass um, actually occurs, you know, it tends to be in our, in our younger years. Um, and bone mass only decreases um, with age, unfortunately. So once we hit kind of around 40, um, we're getting less and less bone mass. So we need to be even more, and especially that coincides then with menopause and the, 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 the loss of those hormones that were helping the bone mass in the first place. So that's where, you know, encouraging our, our youngsters with energy and, and good nutrition, um, but being even more mindful of our calcium needs, um, weight-bearing activity, getting enough rest and sleep um, is super important. So diet, I'm not going to go through this in a lot of detail, but this can be made available to anyone that wants it. So diet, exercise habits, climate, gender, um, also weight, eating disorders, smoking status, and age of menarche, um, and certainly genetics. So if you know that you have a family history of osteoporosis, um, then you might be more likely to develop issues um, with a declining bone mineral density. So I guess um, some of the big take-home messages for myself um, oh, are to try and normalise the period conversation. But um, as Kath helped us with right at the start of this conversation, let's just normalise the whole conversation. Um, so, you know, what we we urinate through our vaginas. <laughs> we don't need to change that in any way, shape or form. Um, understanding, you know, what normal looks like when it comes to menstrual cycles and knowing that they are an indicator of good health. Uh, encouraging women to track their cycles um, so they can learn about their timing and associated symptoms. Um, don't dismiss the concern. So if you do have a concern, please go and seek medical advice. We're so lucky in Australia with the you know, amount of resources that are available to us. Um, understand the nutrients that are important to you as a woman. Monitor, monitor the signs of red S or relative energy deficiency um, and certainly understand the foundations of good bone health. If I had more and more and more and more time, um, I would have loved to cover, and again, um, if there's interest for it, I'm sure we can at some point, uh, breast health, cervical health, pelvic floor health, iron studies, pre and postnatal health, um, health during pregnancy, menopause and postmenopause health. I'm sure there's another 10 there that we could list as well. Um, so lots of things to consider. Um, and then I just went through and asked sort of five questions or 10 questions actually that I thought some women might be asking themselves and again, happy to make all of this available. Um, so, you know, how often should you be getting a regular checkup? Um, and I, you know, I mentioned before, I mean, I have um, a regular, um, my family doctor, um, and I would make a point of going and seeing my family doctor, even if I have nothing to talk about, going and at least getting a referral to get my iron studies checked probably twice a year. Um, and I always find that sitting down and chatting with my GP, invariably there's other conversations that come up. You know, I'm sitting and I'm chatting with her about my iron studies and then I'm like, oh, look, I probably should mention to you that actually I did feel a tiny little lump in my breast. I'm sure it's nothing, but I just... And then that starts a whole nother conversation. Um, <clears throat> you know, what are the screenings um, that we need to um, get um, checked here and how often should we get them checked? Um, you know, so again, hopefully when you, you know, the GP is the sort of first standpoint here and they can help you diarise all these different events. So um, I think even our skin health comes into play here, obviously not reserved for females, but with the high incidences of skin cancer now in Australia, um, you know, we, we know the research um, and we know how important it is to get our skin checked. Um, how can you maintain a healthy diet um, and understanding about, um, you know, a balanced 
diet um, and certainly getting in food from each of the five food groups on a regular basis. The amount of exercise that's actually needed to maintain good health. Um, and I think more importantly than that, finding exercise that you like to do. If you hate going to a gym, don't go to the gym. Um, you know, there's there's so many different forms of activity out there. Um, and I think, you know, gardening is a wonderful activity. Um, and you can throw in all sorts of circuit programs when you do the gardening as well to make it all, you know, a little bit more fun and things. Um, how do you manage stress? You know, we're talking regularly about mental health and well-being and just how important, you know, we're finally realising that, you know, the, the correlation between a mentally healthy, happy, um, a mentally healthy person and a physically healthy person as well. So making sure that, you know, you've got someone in your court that you can talk to um, if you are struggling with your mental health. Um, what should you do if you notice changes in your body? Um, so, you know, are we teaching our young women and girls about, um, you know, palpating their own breasts and understanding, you know, a simple check that can be done in the shower, um, you know, can be a really early warning sign for, for something else that's coming. Um, protecting oneself from sexually transmitted infections and how to practice safe sex. Um, protecting ourselves from heart disease. So we know that it's a leading cause of death, um, certainly in the United States. Um, and how can we as women reduce our risk of heart disease with our diet, with our exercise, with our alcohol consumption, um, smoking if we smoke, um, but certainly around the management of stress, which I think, um, you know, we're finally starting to have those good conversations about. Um, protecting oneself from osteoporosis. So we spoke briefly, and sorry that I've been talking so fast, but there's so much to cover, um, briefly about, um, you know, osteoporosis and how we um, maintain good bone health um, and just realising that, you know, there are so many little things that we can do on a regular basis, particularly with our diet and with exercise to help, um, you know, maintain that strong bone health. Um, and how can we protect ourselves from breast cancer as well, um, which has obviously taken way too many lives, um, certainly in Australia and around the world. So I just thought I'd put this last question out there, um, is as females, what more do we want to hear about? You know, what is the what is the trusted information that we want to hear about? What are the conversations that we need to have? Um, and let's... Um, you know, try and work out platforms and ways that we can we can do that. So please let me know if there are any questions. Um, as I say, I'm not professing to be a, um, a sports medicine doctor or an expert myself, but i um, got a bit of an understanding, um, but certainly hope and happy to just open up the floor and have a conversation um, if there are any questions there. Oh. I think that was great. There's the when we when we're talking about women's health, we're talking about so much. So um I just wanna if if everyone doesn't mind, I'd love just to, you know, have a quick connection um and just any takeaways that you've gone through. So I'll get Sasha to stop sharing. Yep. And what I'll do is I'll also just um stop the recording here and thank everyone for joining us so we can have a more open conversation that's not going to be recorded everywhere <laughs>